Well, welcome to the Common Toad podcast. Uh, the discussion that you're about to hear today is about the relationship between Christianity and the imagination, but it's also really a discussion about our Western culture in general. And I think believers as well as unbelievers and agnostics will find something very worthwhile here. Um, as a professor of cognitive science, John Verveke put it recently, uh, believers and unbelievers have in these last few years started to get past the kind of courtroom style arguments of the last several decades and moved out into the constructive and collaborative discussions of the courtyard. Uh, and I quite liked how we put that. Part of the growing popular understanding, I think, um, has been uh, through writers and thinkers such as uh, Tom Holland and his popular book, Dominion. Um, the thesis of this being that Christianity directly affects our culture, the way we think and argue about morality, uh, the sources of our shared understanding of rights, to the extent that we still have a shared understanding of these things. And so these discussions about theology and religious meanings uh, have value to everyone in the culture because it's like the water we swim in, whether we know it or not. And so um, this is why I think the following discussion is bound to be universal instead of a niche discussion. Uh, so viewers will be able to consider the content uh, at whatever level makes sense to them, the literal, mythological, the metaphorical or the poetic um, and indeed by the end we'll have opened up into questions of stories outside of Christianity as well so uh, I think anyway there's no person I'd rather talk to on this topic than the person who's here today and the fact that he has recently published a new book about imagination and Christianity was a wonderful excuse uh, for me to invite him on the show a second time and uh, I'm grateful to welcome then back to the program the poet priest scholar himself Malcolm Guy. Thank you for being on. Hello, Hello. it's uh, it's uh, nice nice to be to be with you and um, to rejoin the common toad, which I, I think is an excellent podcast. And oh, thank you. appreciate and that very much. Just the kind of conversations that we we do need to have. I like the the idea of uh, the uh, the journey from the courtroom to the courtyard. Yeah. And maybe if we ever if we get around talking about Arthur and the matter of Britain, we might even say the court. The yeah, court right. Court. Very good. Um, so yeah, when we last talked. Uh, which was actually back in 2020, so about a year and a half ago, uh, we broadly discussed poetry and the role of poetry in our lives. Um, and one of the most important things that poetry can do, you told me then, was to, uh, you're quoting Coleridge, you said, just to remove the film of familiarity mm. uh, from our daily lives. And that's a great, I think, way to jump into that thematically into this discussion, but, but also because uh, you quote that too in the introduction to your new book. And I'll hold that up now. So this is the new one, Lifting the Veil, Imagination in the Kingdom of God. It came out late last year. I uh, just got through it a little while ago. Very good, uh, very interesting, and very dense for being such a small volume. Um, <laughs> and you, uh, you open the book. The first line in the book is, this book is a defense of the imagination as a truth-bearing faculty. Uh, so when we think about what imagination is, we all know what you know, we all know. We have one. We know it's important. We like to talk about how important it is to develop it in children, uh, but it tends to be discussed in terms of this thing that's separate from facts, separate from the physical reality. Um, in fact, one of its virtues is seen like you know its ability for us to have take a private break from reality and into the world yeah, of yeah. imagination. So in what sense? So in what sense is it truth bearing and what do you find inadequate, I guess, in the common understanding of imagination? Yeah. Okay, well, uh, the big question, of course, in what sense is it truth-bearing? Well, I think there's the straight, there's the sense, which I think everybody would recognize, that even if we restrict imagination to the realm of the fanciful or the made up, the imagined, I think imagination has much more to do, has a great deal to do with the perception of the actual world as well as it does with what we call the imagined. But if for the moment we begin with the common perception that the imagination is about the imaginary, mm 
imagined worlds, made up stories, mm -hmm. plays which are fictions. I think everybody recognizes that within the, as it were, mutually accepted, playfully um, negotiated realm of the made up story, which the storyteller is ushering you into, whatever the medium of their storytelling, you know, whether it's poetry or film or novel or whatever. I think everybody accepts that within that realm, even though it's fiction and not fact, mm. all kinds of truth is available. And we talk about, um, you know, things being true to the stories. I mean, the, the most the most obvious example would be to think about the, the sheer inner consistency of Tolkien's imagined worlds and the extraordinary lengths to which he went to make a beautiful ringing sound, perfectly structured inner consistency to his worlds, down to the creation of the languages of the, that the people spoke and the mythologies that lay behind those languages. Indeed, as we know, it was his delight in getting the languages right out of which the stories right. are right. So there's a, there's a thing as, as he's true to everything in that. I mean, Seamus Heaney once said in a very interesting phrase, he's in a, an essay published in the 70s, actually, called um, Feeling Into Words. Heaney says, uh, I remember reading this as a sort of young man, you know, in my early 20s. Heaney says, the faking of feelings is a sin against the imagination. Hmm. Now, that was the first time I'd ever heard fake and imagination put in opposite camps. Right. Yeah, that's interesting. Where imagination was the opposite of fake. Mm -hmm. The faking of feelings is a sin against the imagination. Just like, you know, when there's some kind of schlocky sentimental thing that wouldn't have happened in the story and you, 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 it repels you. So, but we know when a thing is beautifully done and there's an inner consistency and the thing is true to itself. So there's certainly a whole ring of truth in that. But there's a little bit more to be said even than that, because, um, I mean, one thinks of the famous exchange, uh, which, which, Shakespeare playfully puts in towards the end of his beautifully imagined play, As You Like It. I mean, As You Like It is a really interesting title, of course, because it's Shakespeare saying, this is your play as much as mine. Uh, anyway, um, you may remember, because it's a comedy, everybody ends up sort of getting married towards the end of it. And um, he's still got a kind of a, an unmatched couple, which is Touchstone, the fool, and Audrey, the shepherdess. And Shakespeare, of course, uh, yes, he does even more seriously later on in King's, King Lear, gives his best lines to his fools. He understands, you know, that there's a wisdom in folly. So, so Touchstone decides to present himself to Audrey in the best possible light as a poet. That's his chat up line, you know, he's a poet. So he starts wooing her uh, as a poet. And she says, she says to him, oh, she says to him, oh, she says, oh, I do not know what poetical is. Is it a true thing? Is it honest in deed and word? Which is partly saying, you know, uh, are your intentions honourable? But he you know, says so she's all, it's all played. So I didn't know not what poetry is. Is it a true thing? And Touchstone says, nay, madam, verily, for our truest poetry is our most feigning. Our truest poetry is our most feigning. Mm -hmm. Give me a chance to make up a story, then I can really tell you the truth. Yeah. And it, and of course, we see this all the time. I mean, if you think about, you know, think about something like um, Shakespeare's Macbeth. I mean, the way, the way we watch the gradual degradation of Macbeth, the kind of metamorphosis of his soul into this kind of thing that is capable of such evil and and can remember, but is no longer capable of good. And then has the, the rags of feeling, but can't connect with them. We see, you know, that, story about an evil act and its consequences and its effects as much on the doer mm -hmm. as on the done unto is so true that we scarcely i mean uh, the, for various reasons which we won't go into you know various political commentators looking talking about what's going on in england now can't mm -hmm. help quoting macbeth you know? mm -hmm. it's just extraordinary you know when when Macbeth does everything, apparently, because his wife is driving him to it, and then later on, they bring him word that she's committed suicide. And he says, he just can't, he's, he's completely 
he's not only murdered murdered Duncan, he's murdered sleep, he's murdered himself. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, he can't respond anymore. You know, one of the most chilling lines in Shakespeare, you know, the queen, my lord is dead. And he says, there would have been a time for such a word. <laughs> yeah. Tomorrow, yeah. <laughs> tomorrow and tomorrow creeps in this petty pace from day to day to the last syllable of recorded time. And all our yesterdays have lighted fools the way to dusty death. You know, out, out brief candle, life's but a walking shadow, a, a poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more. It's a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury signifying nothing. Now, there's an actor on the stage <laughs> comparing life to being an actor on the stage, but also telling you that it's, there's a man who, was, who begins the play full of nobility, who, who basically, when he's told his wife's dead, says, well, shit happens, you know, <laughs> like, and, you know, and then just says this, you know, uh, you see it all. Now, all of that is made up you know, it's, I mean, there was a historical character called Macbeth and there was a King Duncan, but it bears no relation to, you know, watch it. So, but because we've done, to borrow, um, to borrow uh, Coleridge's telling phrase, because we have entered into what he calls that willing suspension of disbelief, which for the moment constitutes poetic truth, because we've agreed with this supposal, we've willingly suspended our disbelief and we've imagined with Shakespeare that this is real, what we get is in fact truth, poetic truth. So, so that's the, the first sense in which, in which you know, the imagination is, is truth bearing in that world of what Coleridge calls the secondary imagination, the world of uh, the things we make, the, the works of fiction. And that's probably the one I expect you want to talk about in terms of tales and stories and mythos. But I feel I must also say that Coleridge goes is a bit more radical than that. Um, he makes the case for the imagination as truth bearing, not only in our created works of imagination, imagination as in the sense of that which beautifully creates the imaginary, which is, a, as Tolkien would say, a, a sub-creator making secondary worlds. Yeah. Ulrich also says, in fact, he says it before he says any of that stuff, he says, imagination is involved in every act of human perception. I mean, he famously says, I mean, I think I quote it in the book, you know, that uh, the primary imagination I hold to be the living power and prime agent of all human perception. There it is. Yes, I was just about to quote it. And then goes right. on to say, and as a repetition in the finite mind of the eternal act of creation in the infinite, I am. Right. Now, I mean, he explains that in different ways. But I, the interesting thing is that phenomenologists now and all kinds of philosophers of mind and perception have finally caught up with Coleridge and saying, well, actually, yeah, he's right. Because... What actually happens, if you think about it in terms of um, raw, unprocessed data, there's, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm hesitant to use computer analogies because I think they're, they're, they're both inadequate and misleading for the human mind. But if we can temporary and with many, with many caveats, borrow one for a second. If you think of bits of data, there's just a stream yeah. of, if you like, unprocessed, all the stuff that's going on. Now, we, if we didn't, have a shaping spirit of imagination, as Coleridge calls it. If we didn't have a predisposition to seek and find form and unity and reflection and to clothe all of that, not only in shape, but in meaning, we would just be experiencing a world of kind of five sensory white noise. It's hard to even but know what that it, what it would mean to say we were experiencing something. Yeah, yeah. But the fact that out of all of this, we, and this is, you know, lots of psychologists have done work on this. We're predisposed to look for and find the human face and to shape the human face. And if people are stuck in isolation for a very long time, even just a bit of time in an isolation chamber, but certainly people who are alone in woods and things like that, if they don't see a human face for a while, they'll start shaping it. <laughs> they start seeing trees and things like that. But Actually, it's not just the face, it's the stars, it's the tree, it's the world, it's perspective, it's all the categories with which we think. We bring a huge amount to the table in terms of the shaping of the phenomena of the world that we perceive and study, even the world we study scientifically. And of course, quantum finally caught up with that and said the observer is you know, yeah. a factor in the observed. Um, now, Coleridge made an interesting analogy. 
returning to our first idea of the creative work, the poem, he said that just as just as in a creative work of literature, say we have a poem in front of us, the physicality of the poem is actually rather disappointingly thin. You know, it's a blank, it's a thin sheet of paper with black and white marks on it. Or if you hear it recorded or hear the poet speaking it, it's a series of temporary waves in the air. Mm-hmm. It's only, but you know, if if you know, if if a poet says, you know, shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May, and summer's lease hath all too short a date. That's just sounds like you know the physicality of those words. None of those words is the thing that you hear and see in your heart and mind and your heart leaps to when you've seen the rough winds shaking the darling buds of May. And when you've thought only too bitterly sometimes that summer's over too soon. And when you've seen in the beauty of a brief day, some reflection of the person you love and then rebelled against the the brevity of it and wanted to say, but thy eternal summer shall not fade. All of that is, not only in Shakespeare's mind, when he when he converts it, if you like, into the kind of brief 14 symbolic lines, summer, the word, the sound of the word summer is not summer, nor is the sound of the word day a day. And beautiful as, you know, there's the phrase, the darling buds of May may be, they are not themselves buds. Yeah. So, <clears throat> Because all language is in that sense symbolic and metaphorical, every poem becomes the true thing that it is as much as a work of the imagination of the receiver of the poem as of the imagination of the writer of it. Now, the great breakthrough for Coleridge was that he thought that was true not just of the poem, but of the cosmos itself. He believed that when we arrive at a truth, even if it's an apparently rigidly scientific or mathematical truth, we are bringing as much to the given as a somebody reading a poem brings to the given. And he felt we'd lost the ability to do that. We need to do that. I mean, he, he, he anticipated this. He, he worked that out philosophically much later in his life, but it, quite early in his poetry, I mean, in the late uh, 1790s, when he wrote a still quite a young man with his little child slumbering beside him when he wrote Frost at Midnight and he imagined his boy growing up, he didn't say, you're going to make a series of statistical observations of, of weather phenomena in the Lake District and you know triangulate the crags and mountains. He said, you know, thou my child shall wander like a breeze by lakes and sandy shores and by beneath the crags. And then he says, so shalt thou see and hear the lovely shapes and sounds intelligible of that eternal language which thy God utters, who doth teach himself in all and all things in himself. So actually he really felt, and I think he's right, that all of us are in some sense co-creating and bringing the extraordinary gifts and intuition of the human imagination to bear on the data so that it shimmers into being as the world we perceive, which is not to say the world we perceive is made up or false. Mm. On the contrary, it's truer because it's shaped from within as well as from without. So the reason that, yeah, the reason I say that your book is so dense for its size is because within that, just that introduction, there are two things that I found uh, really interesting. The first was what you quoted about Coleridge, considering either uh, imagination to be primary, secondary, um, and as a repetition of the infinite mind. Um, The second one that I noticed um, kind of reminded me of an ongoing discussion in some of the corners of the internet that that I've been listening to recently. Um, There's a discussion going on uh, about these kinds of topics uh, between religious and secular people. And some of the more some of the thinkers that have been that are prominent on YouTube and social media, people like there's one called John Bervaki, who's a who I quoted earlier uh, about the about the courtroom versus the courtyard. He's a professor of cognitive science. Uh, was a pastor uh, named Paul Vanderclay, who's uh, mm-hmm. part of the Dutch reform reform tradition. Uh, there's a guy called Jonathan Paggio, who's an icon carver, who's orthodox, finger, and he talks about symbolic meaning. Um, so all very different in terms of their backgrounds and their beliefs and their politics, and they're, they're trying to develop a kind of common language 
concerning that's very interesting. The, 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 there's a lot going on in science i mean yeah brain scientists i mean obviously you've got people like ian mcgillchrist uh you know the master in his emissary i mean that's a really significant another great thing. example yeah. yeah but actually the other thing that's quite interesting is i think um you know the um the brain, the new, the neuroscientists working uh, really at this very close level, are constantly finding that they are up against an impossible difficulty when accounting for consciousness, yeah. whether they go too small or whether they go too big. That they they may be starting at the wrong end of the spectrum, and they mainly mean needing to think about consciousness first and then think about. It's amazing, like the extent to which uh, that idea has turned in terms of popularity yeah it is turning. completely because marginalized the kind of recovery of panpsychism i mean there's a very interesting scientist um who's quite a controversial figure but he's persisted and you know he's a very respectable scientist intellectually and you know completely called rupert sheldrake who wrote yeah. a book a long time ago called a new science of life which he's been doing a series of talks on 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 um, the internet revisiting that book and looking at the accumulation of evidence and having so he's an interesting character who's very much concerned with as it were consciousness beyond or outside the mind and not seeing it as islanded in the concavities of individual skulls however important the neural networks are yeah. so um there's a very you know we're in, i think we're coming towards a bit of a paradigm shift you know in terms of how we account for these and these and these conversations are starting to take place too that you don't see usually happening before so the the people i mentioned before they they have talked in terms Terms, they've been talking sometimes in terms of uh, emergence versus emanation. So emergence yeah, yeah. is a kind of more materialist, bottom-up view of creation, you know, of being emanation being more top-down, where a greater being, maybe somewhat neoplatonic, depending on who's talking about it, is drawing us into greater heights through a kind of attraction or pursuit of the yeah. beautiful, you know, that kind of thing. But which, whichever anyone, whichever way one like tends to think about it, at least there's like this theater where these differences of understanding can be yeah, yeah. talked about. And when I came across in your introduction, your when you talk about Shakespeare, that was that was a great thing to see because it's kind of expressed beautifully um, uh, in, in Shakespeare in your intro on page 19, where it says, let's see, uh, maybe it's page 20. We talk about Shakespeare on the poetic ima imagination. Um, yeah. Uh, 19. A 19, yeah. The poet's eye in a fine frenzy rolling doth glance from heaven to earth, from earth to heaven. And as imagination bodies forth the forms of things unknown, the poet's pen, as imagination bodies forth the forms of things unknown, the poet's pen turns them to shapes and gives to airy nothing a local habitation and name. And that's that's kind of just describing, that's describing the location of the person, right? In between these two. Yeah, the heaven and earth. Yeah, no, they're very much so. I mean, I originally, you know, used to love that passage simply as a description of how poetry works. And it, yeah. it is a description of how poetry works, and particularly how Shakespeare's poetry works. And of course, his imagination literally bodies forth in that his medium as a, as a playwright is not just words, but physical bodies on a stage. Yeah. And his plays come to life precisely when they are bodied forth and bodied forth so differently. Yeah. So, you know, it's great on that. But as I put in that, and that was really a reprise to some degree, I was trying in this shorter book to summarize and then develop, and perhaps to express it more clearly at a more popular level, some of the things that I'd put in my academic book, um, which was published about 12 years ago, called Faith, Open Poetry. And in that, I returned to that Shakespeare passage about poetry and began to think about it theologically and to realize how much it seemed to be riffing on the prologue to John's gospel. Mm. And this whole thing about in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And it's going circling around like that. And it's all very fine and profound, but it's highly abstracted philosophy. And you're thinking, well, I'm sure it's beautiful, but I can't see it. Yeah. <laughs> and then suddenly in verse 14, you get this, and the word was made flesh. <laughs> and dwelt among us, had a habitation amongst us, you know. Um, yeah. and we beheld and it becomes visible and this, this wooing of the invisible into visibility seemed to yeah. me central to a, any, any account of the coherence of creation, um, the whole creation, as well as our individual, you know, how a poet works, um, that the analogies were already there in a sense implicit in that, in and I think consciously put there in 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 that Shakespearean passage. But it's really interesting in these new arguments 
um, where people are trying to look at systems as a the argument precisely is there an emanation out or is there a is there a is there a kind of um, distillation down? You know, all those arguments are being revived. This that little passage of Shakespeare is right at the core of all of that. You know, it's, right. Yeah. And and as you now, now bring in gospel opening lines of the Gospel of John, if if you're talking about the human being as being seen as like this confluence between the material and the divine, almost mm, caught between yeah. it and not really quite knowing what to do. I mean, there's no there's no way of avoiding bringing. The story of Christ into it as far as nor would you, yeah, would you want really to. Thing in, I mean, I've obviously I've only seen this in you know in translation. I'm not an Arabist, but I think there is a bit either it's in the Quran or in one of the early commentaries on it, which speaks of the human being as an isthmus, mm. you know, and this between two seas, as it were, mm -hmm. that the channels of the divine and the earthly are flowing back and forth constantly through the isthmus of what it is to be human. So you, the rest of the book starts, uh, the, it's broken up into three pieces called Christ and the Artistic Imagination, Christ and the Moral Imagination, and Christ and the Prophetic Imagination. Um, so without getting into you know, all the details, uh, it might be worth taking just a little bit of time uh, to talking about a little bit of that and how, um, and how, how you used examples of art um, uh, and of artists making creative leaps to get at the deeper truths of the story, yeah. the Christian story. Uh, do you want to just talk a little bit about that, just how you did that? Yeah. I mean, these three aspects of imagination, you know, the, 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 the poetic, the moral, and the prophetic. I mean, this originally arose. I was invited. I mean, I was really slightly staggered and honored to get the invitation, but I was invited to give a set of lectures that happens annually. Regent College in Vancouver, which is called the Lang Lectures. Mm. And um, my predecessors in it had been people like Ian McGilchrist gave one and, and Marilyn Robinson gave one. So I was kind of slightly um, blown away to be drawn from comparative obscurity and asked to do Make, it. Makes sense to me, but yeah. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so it was a real chance to develop the thought that you naturally thought in this sense, because it's three lectures, it was three. And I thought, well, I've got a chance to... I mean, Coleridge says we distinguish, but we don't divide. And I try and show how these things flow into each other. But I wanted to, to think about it. And I started with the poetic imagination precisely because of this parallel that happens in the, in the which I develop in the preface between Shakespeare's account of poetry and John the Evangelist's account of incarnation, because it seemed to me that there were, there were obvious, obvious um, parallels. So when I, when I, when I then, um, so I talked a lot about, about bodying forth and incarnation, but then I had a little look at how, how certain writers had precisely by doing what, he, what, Cole, what uh, Shakespeare says, their eyes had glanced from heaven to earth, from earth to heaven, but they hadn't kept them separate. They were then looking for this, this bodying forth that could be a local habitation that, that could in, you know, woo the invisible. Mm. into visibility or, yeah. or kind of flesh the abstract out into the body. I mean, you're saying and that so, we're, we're aware of two, these two things. We're aware of these things being true yeah. to us. So it's, yeah. it's a matter of trying to find out how yeah. to yeah. assimilate them somehow. And I think there's been a great danger in our culture that we've, we're aware of the two. But I think culture since the Enlightenment has split them off. Right. So we have a totally abstracted philosophical, mathematical sense of disembodied truths. Right. And then we have this world of the physical realm that is completely, completely evacuated of meaning. It's quantity, but not quality. You know, it's uh, and this is I mean, many people would take this back to Descartes, you know, that the, the, he just divides between, you know, res extensa the things and, you know, res and, and you know, the things of the intellect. And even Descartes had a problem about how to put them together. I mean, bizarrely, he thought the point of connection was the pineal gland, you know, like the brain. <laughs> it's as good as anyone's back guess. then, yeah. <laughs> so I was saying, well, look, we, you know, this is a problem we didn't used to have. Yeah. We used to know that story, poem, play was doing this connecting and embodying for us. So the examples I used, I used a, a little poem by a, by a contemporary... Um, uh, poet Lucy Shaw, mm. who's writing, she's in her 90s, she's still writing really well. Yeah. 
And um, she has a poem called kinesis, which is a fine Greek word and is the technical word that's used theologically to speak of the idea of the self emptying, that the divine out of compassion doesn't remain, you know, and it's, there's a famous passage in Philippians, uh, which I think anybody would, whether they were Christian or not, would be interested in just as a description of a certain kind of movement. It says, um, though he was found in form equal to God, he did not cling to equality with God, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant and mm -hmm. became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. So, so there's this kenosis. And I, I've read reams of high-end intellectual theology about kenosis, mm -hmm. with, you know, untransliterated Greek. So I was, you know, going to this poem, I saw a poem called Kenosis. I thought, oh, here we go, you know, to borrow a phrase of the poet Edwin Muir, the word made flesh is here made words again. Oh, you know, <laughs> of course, what you get is something quite different. Just here's the opening lines of this poem. And again, I think this was really interesting education to me as a man, because I think this is a woman writing in a way that brings the depth of her grounded being as a woman into the into play mm -hmm. and of a man a perspective through her imagination which he might not otherwise have so she says in sleep his infant mouth works in and out he is so new his silk skin has not yet been rough by plain and wooden beam nor so far as he had to deal with human doubt and then this is great he is in a dream of nipple found of blue white milk of curving skin and pulsing in his ear the inner throb of a warm heart's repeated sound. I mean, mm -hmm. that that's a woman who's had a baby at the breast, able to imagine what it's like to be the baby at the breast from the baby's perspective. Yeah. And it's astonishingly vivid. It's, mm -hmm. it's language, I mean, again, none of those words is the thing that you and I immediately see and are invited imaginatively to inhabit in fact i would say there's something so i mean it's very sort of pure and simple there's something you know his only memories float from fluid space i mean that was true of all of us at one point we all made that transition from floating in the womb and there's this poem almost woos us back to our own infancy yeah. and then there's an incredibly subtle thing going on because She's, you know, she's a very well-educated well woman and she knows perfectly well that the Latin root of the word infants means without speech. That's what an infant is. It's somebody who has no words. So his infant mouth, not a mouth that speaks, works in and out. It's his infant mouth is now suckling, but what he's suckling is what... But this one who is infants is the word, <laughs> is the word. You know, this is so that that's the fullness, if you like, of the kind of I mean, the paradox, the fullness of the empty. So that was just an example for me. And uh, we I also had a rather nice, um, you know, there's a, there's a, somebody, the, my, my editor, Ned Bustard, found a really interesting um, piece called the uh, artistic piece called The Vulnerable God, a charcoal drawing by Chet Craig Hawkins, which yeah, was there. So I wanted to give that as a very vivid example of poetic imagination doing what it should do, not simply reiterating the agreed abstractions of a, a faith community. Right, yeah. Focusing, and I think there's a lot of awfully bad Christian writing and Christian art that just does that. Yeah. Just sloganizes and, you know, often sentimentalizes. And so, you know, so she's not doing anything like that. She's kind of going right to the core of the central humanity. She's got that central idea. But of course, in the way she describes it, in every verse that she gives us the infant, she does allude to and echo out to the eventual sufferings of the man and its meaning. Yeah. So I, I just use that as an example in the, in the uh, and there are various others. I used a George Herbert poem um, uh, and, and, and a poem of my own um, to think about, about how do we approach these over familiar images? Um, particularly because of Christmas cards, you know, the, in almost all those, you know, medieval and Renaissance paintings of, of Mary and Jesus, it's all incredibly rich and hieratic and the infant isn't, doesn't look like a baby at all. I mean, it's a stiff little sort of 
Yes. <laughs> Give him an Episcopal blessing, you know. He knows exactly <laughs> what he's doing. <laughs> you know, so so I thought, well, here's a piece of imagination that's really restoring uh, a bit of theology. Um, so so you know, I used I mainly used examples from from poetry, I went on, of course, to speak of, uh, you know, I don't know if you want to pause there or me to summarize what I said about the moral and the prophetic imagination as well, but but essentially, um, you know, my, my Christ in the poetic imagination was very much about the imagination as one of the arts of incarnation. And I yeah. illustrated it in various ways. When, when it came to the prophetic imagination, I I start with a, I mean, I can't remember the order in which I say these things, but, but essentially, um, this is a new aspect of the way of how the imagination is truth, truth bearing. Right? I mean, if you think of the golden rule as, you know, whether you find it in Christ, which you do, but you find it in almost any religious system, essentially do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Hmm. Um, that involves a leap of imagination in order to, to apply that. In order to to do that, you actually have to imagine yourself at the receiving end of your own actions yep. as done unto rather than do it. it what you you know when you do something to someone whether you're snubbing them or tipping them or or or, or, or uh, exploiting them or employing them or whatever you're doing you have for a moment to imagine that you're them and to see to experience yourself as the other and them as the self yeah um and if we couldn't do that, then a, a moral life and an empathic life and indeed any form of community life and indeed love itself would not be possible. It's all posited on this ability to imagine yourself as the other. And of course, one of the things that trains you to do that is storytelling, mm -hmm. myths, tales, but novels. I mean, you know, Dickens is a great gift. Shakespeare gives us this that every time every time we 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 enter into an imaginative world those necessary if you like moral pathways and muscles that enable us to do this act of empathy are being trained and strengthened it's interesting yeah i really like to think about it in terms of imagination more morality um in in the part of um in the section of christ and the moral imagination another example that as you give is the parable of the grain of wheat um, and that's just another example of of the kind how how the counterintuitive moral teachings in the Gospels reflect some of the observable counterintuitive aspects of nature as well. Yeah, because of that, you know, he who seeks to save his life. Really, the, the point about the grain of wheat is you've got to let something go in order to receive it back in a new way. You, right. Unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it bears no fruit. But if it dies, it yields a rich harvest. And he... In one sense, Jesus is foretelling his own death and resurrection. Mm -hmm. Some people say, well, that's great. That's what, but that's not the con. I mean, that's all true. Mm -hmm. But the context, of course, is is all the disciples doing the, the kind of crap thing which the church has done ever since, which is jockeying for position and trying to see who's boss and who's in charge and all this. And it's all about who gets to sit on the right hand and the left hand. And this is no, yeah. no, 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 you, you don't get it. All Amazing. of this is about letting that go. You know? Yeah. It's amazing how how that is all in the gospels, and you can't always tell how consciously it's been put in there. You know, like you even talk about it sometimes in terms of the transfiguration too, just how they were given a glimpse into what was to come, but they didn't really know what they were dealing with. They knew they were dealing with something. Yeah, yeah but they that's didn't know absolutely what. I think, you know, I really think that's a very interesting aspect of the Gospels that you quite often get almost this editorial comment, you know, where it says, yeah. he said this, and then it almost goes like into practice, but they didn't understand it at the time, you know, but later they did. Yeah. I find that very reassuring. I mean, I find it reassuring because most of the time when I'm re reading the Gospels, I don't totally get it either. And I think, well, at least I'm in good company. Yeah. But there's a promise that there is more. And I mean, I've been reading the Gospels, you know, for most of my life and I keep coming back to them and they're fresh so there's there's that <laughs> and that by the way is also you know one of the things that's sometimes flung in the teeth of members of my faith I mean you know uh, by the usual scoffers is that oh well they say you know the gospels were written quite a long time after the events 
Um, I mean, obviously the stories go back to the events, but you know, there's a quite a long period of oral transmission and then it comes to be written down and they, they assume as if, as if it's a shut, that's a shut case. And I'd say, well, forget it. Can't be true. Like, unless somebody was tweeting it at the moment, it's not worth reading. You think, no, wait yeah. a minute. No, how many tweets at the moment are worth having? If the most mind boggling and totally um, cosmos changing unexpected event when the transcendent became imminent and the crit happened, you know, it might be possible that it might, we might ex expect that, that finite human minds might take a couple of generations to go, whoa, what just happened there? And gradually develop it. And that's what you see, this huge thing is disclosed. And it, it's very interesting that the Christian scripture deliberately, it's multivocal and it's it's cross-lingual and cross cross cultural and race-wise. I mean, it's clearly, you know, Matthew is coming very much out of a Jewish perspective. John is coming very much out of a Greek perspective. You know, all this stuff is happening um, and everybody's trying to get a little bit more of this and you kind of see it unfolding. Now, in my view, it, it hasn't finished unfolding and I, I don't see, I think, you know, we're still beginning to see the implications of those events. Yeah. Now, and it's very clear that there are certain things which are clear to us now and that weren't at all clear because cultural habits and the, the kind of embedded structures of power uh, were still so ingrained in that world. I mean, the obvious one is slavery, you know, that everything that Jesus says, including the obvious thing that, you know, if you love your neighbor as yourself, you imagine yourself as your neighbor and therefore you... <laughs> you don't do to your neighbor what you'd not want to be done to yourself, that rules slavery out immediately because if you're a free person, you wouldn't want to be a slave. I mean, you know, and yet you see them wrestling with it. I mean, and when, um, I'm gonna have to just turn this off, I'm being, um, I'm being wrong, but I'll just, I don't know, I don't know how to, anyway, let's turn it off. Uh, so uh, yeah. I mean, you know, there's this extraordinary epistle, uh, you know, where there's a runaway slave and Paul actually returns him. But the terms in which he returns, he persuades Onesimus to go back. By the time he's finished telling, telling the slave owner that Onesimus is entirely made in the image of God and that they're both servants of Christ and telling, him, you know, like the league, you know, the slavery has become a legal fiction, you know, because there's a new relationship. Yeah. But it took, it took, um, the church an unconscionably long time to actually start changing society in that light. I was just reading some of the uh, the writing of St. Gregory of Nyssa on this question of slavery, who gets it back in the fourth century, about as nails it about as easily, as easily, seemingly easily, and as straightforwardly as just about anything <laughs> that I've read anywhere against slavery. And it's, it, it does give you that sense of that, like, it's, it's always been there, you know, like uh, the, the abolition, the, the kind of abolition of, of people dominating other people is built into that gospel message, but it's. Yeah, it is. And I mean, I mean, Tom Holland makes that clear in the way that, I mean, but, but it was such a universal institution economically. Right in the ancient world, that it did take a long time to shift it. Well, I have uh, in a couple of my notes uh, of questions that I was gonna ask you, I have a few things in bold with the heading, a skeptic interrupts, which so which I, I will just put in here just in case anybody is listening to us talk and thinking about it themselves. Um, just some questions that people might have about our discussion in terms of imagination. Um, and, and, I, and, and here I put, I say, how does someone know whether or not their imaginative leap is truth bearing? Is this not the basis of an enormous amount of schismatic and even at times violent activity within Christianity? So getting to decide what is heresy and what is good new explanation of a Christian doctrine? How do, how do, yeah. how do we, how does, how do you do that? Well, I, I kind of would want to, um, return to that saying of Jesus is about discernment because he obviously these questions were posed in those days where he says you know look at the fruit look at what kind of fruit does this bear you know a sound tree cannot bear bad fruit nor a bad fruit you know by their fruits you shall know them and and of course Paul talks about the fruits of the spirit so 
when a, I mean, for example, I mean, the most obvious example is a scientific analogy. When a when a great scientist, a kind of paradigm shifting scientist, makes an imaginative leap, like the leap that says maybe it's a heliocentric system, maybe we're going around the sun and it's not the other way around. Yeah. What they do is they imagine this wild, crazy thing, and they sort of build up this imaginary picture, and they say, if that were the case, what would these observations look like? Does this make more sense? of the observed phenomena rather than less. And I mean, Aristotle started to do that. I mean, he called it salto tai phenomena, saving the phenomena, you know. Does this imaginative leap make more sense of what I was puzzled by before or less? Mm -hmm. Now, if it was, I was puzzled by the gospel and, you know, but we, we can take it further. Does it make more sense of my experience of being human than less? Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the things that attracted, I mean, I was an atheist for quite some time and I, you know, I was very much persuaded by a kind of materialist thing. I mean, that cracked in various ways. But one of the things that, that curiously enough, that I thought had driven me away from Christianity was the problem of evil. You know, the classic, well, why is there suffering if there's a good God who's omnipotent, that kind of thing. And, um, but I, more I looked at the great mythos, the great story of fall, and redemption of an originally good creation of fallen redemption. And I tried to think about my own failings and the failings of my friends and the moral quagmires of various sorts in which we found ourselves in our chaotic student lives. The more I, the more I thought about that, the more it made sense to think of a good thing gone wrong mm -hmm. and capable of being redeemed than to think of two equal and opposite forces of good and evil and one person is utterly good and another person is utterly bad, the kind of dualistic or manichaeistic view. Yeah. I found the Augustinian view of fall and redemption, of perversion and reconversion of initially good things, just made, I actually thought, you know, this story makes more sense of my human experience. Mm -hmm. And even if it's just a supposal, while I'm supposing it, certain things fall into place, which otherwise wouldn't. Yeah, that's right. You, you have to, you, you can, you have to at least, if you do the, the experiment in your mind and say, well, let's just take, let's just take, for example, maybe these things are true. Let's see what happens if we act like these things are true and, and see what you get out of it. One of the things that was fascinating to me, I mean, I, I suppose I think of myself now as like a Christian agnostic or something, if that means anything, but uh, because I've read Tom Holland and I've read now a lot of, George MacDonald and C.S. Lewis and things oh, like that. And I feel closer than I have been uh, yeah, yeah. The, to the inside than the out. I, 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 one of the things I realized is that I was afraid that I would lose my ability to, uh, my, my, my rational faculty would have to be stamped out. And I found oh, okay. that to be not true at all. I found actually the, the struggles and the arguments were of a higher quality, closer to the inside than the outside, which was quite- Yeah, yeah. I, I was very moved by, by, you know, the phrase in Augustine credo et in telegram, I believe in order to understand. Yeah. Now, one of the things that kept me from Christianity was precisely the feeling that I was going to leave, you know, park my mind at the door and I'm just going to follow a road. Right. And... A no, I mean, I find that I can think even more interestingly and speculatively from inside this supposal than from outside, you know. Yeah. But yeah, you do, you do say, well, let me imagine that it might be the case. Let me willing to. But then, then you get some results you actually begin to see things work. So you have a little bit more trust in it and then yeah. you go forward and something more confirms it. Um, but you all, one of the things I think that, that's really important in, in, in all of that is that even if you become a great deal more sure of it than you were when you first made your imaginative supposal, I think there's a constant warning in all good spiritual writing and certainly in all good um, Christian theology that every formulation, however precious and extremely helpful to you, is an approximation, is a, is a, is a mere formulation. I mean, there's a fabulous yeah. um, poem of Lewis's called uh, An Apologist's Evening Prayer, where, where he says, um, thoughts are but coins. Let me not trust instead of thee their thin-worn image of thy head. From all my thoughts, even my thoughts of thee, O thou fair silence, fall and set me free. Hmm. He keeps saying, God, the best thoughts I've ever had of you are not you. 
don't let me ever substitute any of my formulas for the living thing, the missing. Yeah, thing. that's great. What is that from? That's from a poem called An Apologist's Evening Prayer. Um, yeah. In which he says, interestingly, that he's almost more embarrassed by his successes as an apologist. He's kind of looking back than his failures, you know. He says, you know, um, from, you know, all the victories I seem to score on my behalf, at which the angels weep even while the audience laugh, you know, from all <laughs> my... <laughs> you know, that's, that's great. Well, I want to get to, um, my goodness, when I look at the time, I, I want to get to uh, talking a little bit about folk, so-called folk religion and the Christian relationship. So I'm going to use this as an opportunity. Our intermission is pouring a little bit of scotch. Oh, that's very good. Is that a Lagavulin? Well, I've made a... I've made a uh, a uh, compromise with my wallet. It's a Lagavulin, but it's, I don't know if you can see this. It's Lagavulin 8. Yeah, yeah yes, right. This is a. Still good, still Hattel. smoking. Ooh, I, never had this that. This is a very smoky Isla, Isla, Isla malt as well. It's very nice. Um, but uh, the fact is that we can't, I just can't seem to get Lagavulin, even if I had the money, I, I can't get Lagavulin 16 year old in England. Oh, really? really. I think that's, I, so I have a little, well, I, I help run a little shop uh, and, uh, and we've, I think that's why we got eight is because 16 was, at that time possible it's been hard to get good whiskey this past year but uh yeah. although it's not quite the same it's actually quite good at eight and oh, it, is. Uh, yeah, it yeah, still no, keeps I, I, it keeps the peatiness and you don't have to spend over a hundred dollars you can spend 60 instead so yeah, yeah exactly right. yeah. <laughs> mm. it's lunch yeah. well i wanted to um the other part when i emailed you i said i wanted to bring in this other topic big topic we'll see how far we can get with it but i heard a podcast you did last year i think it was on the the perennial digression series it's quite a good one um where you talk about the uh what you call the missed opportunity in north america um and uh, i kind of sat straight up because it was something that had been occupying my thoughts as well um i'm from new england and i had last year talked to the medicine woman from uh, the mohegans uh, who was part of a long uh, rich history of uh, tribes that had located mostly in what's today Connecticut. Um, but the missed opportunity um, was the failure of Christianity in America to kind of take note and incorporate the rich tradition, or at least have some kind of deep, good, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, synthesis of the rich tradition of like tales and motifs yeah. and beliefs into the culture. Meanwhile, Britain, you know, seems just much older place from our perspective, from a European perspective, but seems to have integrated parts of yeah, so-called pagan themes and stories much more successfully. And and, yeah, and I wonder what I mean, you think about that, why that is. Or... Okay, so if what we're saying about the poetic imagination at a basic level is true, then we should be at least sympathetic to and interested in all the great creative tales and myths. Right. Um, in terms of the truth that they embody, not in terms of their literal content, but in terms of what's bodied forth mm -hmm. and given a local adaptation and a name in them. And... Um, we should, if we if we think, I mean, I'm a Christian, I actually think Christianity is the case. And if I think it is the case that at the core of the cosmos is this, this fundamental pattern of death and resurrection that's reflected in, you know, winter and summer and night and day and the saying of the seed, all these outer manifestations are, mani are all full of meaning. And part of the meaning is death and resurrection and that, that that meaning itself happened once in history and, you know, really did happen. If I think that's the case, then I'm going to expect that something of that might be reflected in all kinds of stories I haven't heard and all kinds of intuitions. I and there might yeah. be, be parallels. Now, the, the, the biblical, as it were, the locus classicus for this understanding, this way of thinking about culture, is right there in, in the Acts of the Apostles. And it's right there with St. Paul, who's always seen as the great big doctrinaire person. But, you know... The famous story of Paul being taken to to um, to Athens and Luke, who's telling us the story, you know, has actually very says at the beginning that Paul was personally you know, as a very good, pious, kosher Jew, you know, was quite disgusted by all the 
quote unquote idolatry in the statues and stuff, but something happened, something quite radical reworking of his empathies between his first arrival and when they finally drag him out on the Areopagus, Mars Hill, but we call it Mars Hill, but actually Areopagus is what it is. And of mm. course, Are is Mars, but Pegasus is field, Mars field. So it's right at the heart. And he, he, he makes a speech. You remember it's in Acts 17, he says, men of Athens. He didn't say, men of Athens, you are all benighted, heathen idolaters and you know god condemns you utterly unless you tick the box and sign up to my version he doesn't say anything like that in spite of the fact that that's the kind of thing i've heard some Greek preachers say what he says he says men of athens i see that in every way you are very religious and as i observed i observed the objects of your worship you know i didn't just trash them i looked at them as i observed the object of your worship i saw this statue to an unknown god he whom you worship without knowing, him I preach. I want to tell you a bit more about the person you're already worshipping. Mm -hmm. And then he says, for he is, but he is not to be confined in a statue. You know, says, some of your own poets have said, and then he quotes two Greek poets. I mean, uh, you know, some of it, these are fragments. We don't have the rest of the poetry. He says, we are the children of God. And then he quotes the things in him, we live and move and have our being. That's Paul <laughs> quoting a pagan Greek poet mm. in order to bring it to the light of Christ and say, now let me try and show you how the story I have to tell meshes in with, but also it judges in one respect because he doesn't live in statues, but it also brings it to focus. Your stuff. So that's the approach he's taking. Now, somehow or other that got lost in the mix in some later forms of mission work, particularly in the 19th century. Yep. But luckily for us in the British Isles, that approach was still very much at work when Christianity came to these islands and the Celtic Christians, particularly the Irish monks, were, I mean, to take one of my heroes, Colin, Colin who founded Iona and so on, I mean, he was trained both as a Druid and as a Christian monk. Wow. That's so interesting. He had all that to draw on. And of course he did the, he went into full Irish warrior thing and fought a battle on a beach everywhere and then repented and then went off and founded Iona, you know, and so on. Yeah. But the, an inch, a series of intuitions that were all already there in the Celtic mindset were made richly available to his faith and his preaching. Mm -hmm. His faith and his preaching is centrally orthodoxly Christian, but it's, it's the teaching about a Pantocrator, about the one who created the whole cosmos. So what happened later on as the Christian centuries developed in the early and late Middle Ages was that a series of folk tales which already existed and had their own things, which had deep motifs. I mean, for example, in both Welsh and Cornish and Irish mythological folk tale, there are cauldrons of plenty. There are these vessels into which you can put broken things and great feasts come out. There are magical spears that 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 have both wounded but also healed. Now, something extraordinary happens when people decide to tell the story of Arthur and the Knights of the Holy Grail, and you get Arthur's a Christian king. All the stories make it clear he's a Christian king. They 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 they, they, they mark out the events saying it was at the Feast of Pentecost. You know the story of Gawain and the Green Knight. Yeah. At Christmas. Right. All the Christian feasts are there. And there are bishops and all that caper and there's a chapel and everything. But there's also a magician called Merlin. You know, there's a green knight. There, there, are, there are ladies of the lake. There are all these people that sort of brought together. Chapman. And then yeah. the thing that interests me most is, of course, the, the stories of the Grail. I'm, I'm actually trying to write my own poetic cycle on that at the moment. So I'm rereading all the sources. And um, oh, it's a really interesting fact. Lewis points this out in a review of an edition of Mallory, an obscure essay by Lewis. He says... Um, the really interesting thing about the grail, it's clear that a lot of the grail imagery, the beautiful processions, the candle, the seven branch candlesticks, the high holding of the chalice, the idea that it is the very chalice that, that Jesus held at the last supper, that Josephus held it to catch the blood from the cross, all that stuff. It's clearly very Christian and it's clearly based on a very high sacramentalism, except, and so it says, the Cistercians who developed that were all a group of male monastic priests. There was no female priesthood, and the only place that the Eucharist was ever celebrated mm 
was inside a consecrated chapel in the hands of a properly ordained priest. And it was an mm. entirely male setup and it was entirely sacred and non-secular, right? Yeah. But in the Grail story, <laughs> the Grail is always carried by a Grail maiden. The Grail appears in the middle of Camelot, in the middle of the, 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 the secular realm. And all the knights who see it have a religious experience, but at the same time, they have a, they have a, a secular experience because the Grail creates for them all the things they like best to eat and drink. And there's music and there's a beautiful, you know. Mm -hmm. So it, it's as though a secular storyteller who's been deeply moved by this sacred stuff and all the Christological stuff, like busts it out from the enclave of the church and imaginatively starts setting it to work in the midst of all the slightly unconverted stuff and says, what would happen if, you know, yeah. and then yeah. what would happen if a mysterious, you know, um, female embodiment of the flowing water itself walked into a place where there was a great, you know, like, how would that work? And these weird and beautiful and strangely moving Newman stories emerged out of that. And they were read by people who both understood and believed the Christian faith, but also had this folk memory. Mm -hmm. And there was a kind of conversation going on. And of course, now lots of people, including me, have been attracted to the Christian faith as much through the mystery of these half pagan half christian marriages and meetings of this as through you know an official book of doctrine yeah there's something beautiful going on so i think what i said in that podcast back in the day was i've read a little bit obviously translate of the accounts of turtle island of the whole of many of the 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 uh, first nations stories and i find them wonderful and fascinating and you know I say to myself, how would, you know, and I remember when I was a kid in Canada, I was briefly youth and teenager in Canada. We used to sing a, a thing called the Huron Carol, um, which I think was a translation from a, a Jesuit, Bebeuf, who was martyred, you know, but, you know, he he had written a thing which you know, was in the moon of winter time when all the birds had fled, that mighty, this is an account of the incarnation, that mighty Gitche Manitou sent angel choirs instead before the light, their stars grew dim and wandering hunters heard the hymn. Wow. And he has a ragged, wow. he has, instead of the shepherds, it's hunters coming. And, and instead of him being in swaddling clothes, he has a ragged robe of rabbit skin and wrapped his beauty round, you know. Wow. So there's something happening there. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I want more of that. You know? Absolutely. No, I'm I completely on board for that. That's kind of the thing, like that. And I wonder if it's if it's what the hang up is. And, and I wonder if there's maybe be coming from two directions. I mean, maybe in, in one sense, it could be that we in the Americas still can't or refuse to face what happened to the first people. That's one problem. Right. I mean, maybe we still I mean, how often obviously everybody knows in some sense that the that the that the natives got all but wiped out. Um, although there's still many, many rich traditions still going strong just below the surface of the mainstream. Oh, yeah. um, but but maybe the fact that we don't want to face that yeah. in this yeah, age. I think there is a, it's a fairly recent genocide, which has never been properly confessed or accounted for, yeah. and that creates inhibitions. I'll tell you an interesting historical thing about the British scenario. Obviously, one of the things that happened um, when, when the Romans left, I mean, there was already Christianity in Britain then, and there were, you know, and there were some Celtic Christians, but obviously many Celtic pagans. The Romans left, and the Saxons invaded, and the Celts were pushed into the west. So there was yeah. a bit of a remnant. But in the where I'm living in Norfolk, you know, you can still, you can still, there's still quite a few Type O blood groups, but basically it's completely Saxon culture, right? Mm -hmm. So I think while the Saxons were in play, they even the Christian Saxons they couldn't quite, quite hear the Celtic stories, because they were still, in a sense, guilt bound by what they'd done to the Celts. That's interesting. What happened, the, the place where we suddenly get the Arthurian revival in the 11th and 12th centuries, it's almost all written in French or Latin, not English, is when the Normans invaded Britain. Right. <laughs> and the Celts were the underdog, and the, the Saxons were the underdog. Now, because politically, the yeah. Normans didn't want to tell stories about the previous Saxon kings because they literally just displaced them. But hey, look, before the Saxons got here, they were, we're pushing from the other side. <laughs> so 
So suddenly they start, so the Geoffrey of Monmouth, you know, who gives us, a, brings us Merlin into the story and tells, you know, the Historia Regnum Britorum. Yeah. The very word Britain is really important because it's not England. It's not, so that there's this weird cultural alliance <coughs> between the French speaking Normans and the Anglo Normans and the Celts because they both, they, you know, they both, you know, one was oppressed by the Saxons and the other. So do you know what I mean? We had a complicated history too, yeah. but there was a political moment where suddenly these, un, these, these suppressed stories of a British king who had himself fought the Saxons came to the fore, but it happened to come to the fore yeah. at a time when the church was developing some of its most beautiful mystical sacramental theology yep. about chalice and hey right. suddenly these old suppressed stories about magical cups and spears and um you know a king who had descended down into the underworld and looked into a cauldron and come up you know all of that suddenly made a whole load of sense that's, so the moment may come in North America. What I'm saying is it may not be just now the historical moment, but the most important thing is to keep those stories going and nurture the First Nations people who hold them yeah, and let yeah. them hold them. Yeah. So that finally when Protestant American Christians are ready for it or, you know, whatever, you know, they can start having a conversation that should have happened 200 years ago. Yeah. No, that's, that, that's very interesting. And I have, a, I have a feeling that it may have to be, maybe almost more of a regional thing than a national because the country's so big or continental because the country is so big. Um, and there's so many like various traditions that are going on. Um, yeah, I mean, I because I mean, one thing that always strikes me is causes a slight shudder to me, even though people say it apologetically to me. I mean, obviously lots of Americans love Britain because they think of us as an old country. Mm. And they say to me, oh, you know, we're such a young country. And I go, no, you are not a young country. <laughs> Only you in a very a narrow country. sense. Yeah. You have a long history. It's just not in your language, you know, learn it. All right, so I'll work on that problem and get back to you when we've solved it over here. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's also, there's I, the other problem of... I think it would be a, a great enrichment. You know, I don't want this ever to be seen as, oh, we'll we'll pick out the bits of the pagan legends that we already agree with and know about and fit them into Christ. I don't mean that at all. This is the I problem. There is yeah. real There's wisdom, the appropriation. There's the appropriation. Wisdom from Christ himself, which is available. And I think the whole of Christendom is richer because, yeah. because of the Arthurian stories. And the whole of Christendom will be richer because of these stories from North America, where that's the tight it. that's the tight rope you have to walk. You have to you have to na navigate the people that don't even want to deal with the fact that there was a genocide. And then there's another side which is very sensitive in many parts for good reason to the question of appropriating culture. Culture, yeah, 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 and and a lot of it is genuinely important. And some of it is you know people don't think anyone you know that if you're white you shouldn't have a burrito truck or something like that you know like it can yeah, get yeah, a little yeah. bit crazy but but right in between this the yeah. question is can you can you in a thoughtful collaborative way yeah synthesize something yeah. cultural appreciation is when you kind of go for a few iconic images and skin off a few trinkets and then use them for your own entirely unmodified purposes that's no good. <laughs> entirely unmodified that's exactly yeah. right yeah yeah what yeah. i'm talking about is a deep, imaginative, empathic conversation in which you really listen, which is the type of that is Paul's opening sentence. Yep. Men of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious as I observed the objects of your worship. He's learning something. And actually, Luke tells us that he stayed there two years debating which means listening as well as speaking every day with the pagans in the area of pagans. Interesting. Yeah, that's very and interesting. And he actually says he didn't make very many converts, you know, but right. yeah. one of them was called, but he tells them that one of them was a guy called Dionysus, um, obviously named after the great god Dionysus. And the church had a belief, which I think scholars dispute now, that the, the person who used to be known as Dionysus, the Areopagite, the theologian, Dionysus the Areopagite, who's now called Pseudo Dionysus because they don't think it could have been the same person. But the church believed it was this very person for a yep. long time. 
who wrote a book on the names of God and on the hierarchies of the angels and wrote some of the finest early Christian mystical theology. For a long time, that was attributed to some pagan guy who debated with Paul for two years. Yeah. Who was actually wow. caught after the god Dionysus. That's ex- that's really interesting. Yeah, I just was leaping through because I was thinking about this, this. I don't know if you've ever seen this book, but or this author, Nikolai Leskov, the uh, 19th century Russian writer. Um, he um, he wrote a story called On the Edge of the World, and it was about, uh, it takes the perspective of this Orthodox bishop who's trying to get people baptized in Eastern Siberia. And he's just thrilled because there's this, there's this uh, preacher out there who's making r- records in the amount of baptisms that they're having and winning souls and everything. And then he finally gets out there and realizes that he's just kind of offering vodka to people. And he, he finds the, 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 the priest uh, who was uh, kind of completely hesitant, didn't want to participate in that at all, uh, who had actually experience with the people out in Eastern Siberia was right and that they had their own dignity to it and that, and, and that it wasn't about you know a conveyor belt of souls um and it, yeah, it just yeah. kind of it just kind of reminded me of that yeah, um, there's, there's all kinds of stuff i tell you a very interesting book in this respect um there's a book by a catholic um writer called vincent uh, donovan called an epistle from the Marsai. it's called christian it's actually called christianity rediscovered hmm. an epistle from the Marsai, not an epistle to the Marsai. And it's about how he was at one of these Catholic mission stations where all the Maasai came in, you know, because they needed medical treatment or they wanted to get bits and pieces that were on offer. Mm -hmm. And then Christianity made no difference and they went off. And eventually he decides to go and travel with them and they invite him. And the whole thing is about how he listens to these Maasai stories and how more and more they reform his own sense of Christianity. And it is about how people are converted and there are baptism and all that stuff, but it's a very different way of doing it. It is a very good way of doing it. And I, I find that, you know, who I find in, in to me, who, who gets me closer and closer uh, to that is, is George MacDonald in his own way, because of the way oh, yeah. he incorporates. I just finished Fantasties a few months ago. That's and, an astonishing uh, book. Yeah. It's so good. And, and I, and it, it was one of those books where as soon as I finished it, I, I felt like maybe I should start it over and oh, I yeah, didn't even know really, what to say about it exactly. Lewis right? used to reread it regularly as he reread Lilith regularly. I've just reread Lilith because I'm, there's a new edition of it coming out. I've, I've sort of accidentally become the president of the George MacDonald Society. <laughs> good so for you. I, <laughs> I am. Um, I, I'm, I've written a foreword to the new edition of, of Lilith. By the way, just talking about the fact that this guy that wrote mystical theology was called Dionysus. Mm. Um, I love the bit in Prince Caspian where at the liberation of, 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 of that land, you know, from its oppression, the river God comes up and then Dionysus appears. You know, Dionysus in the Mina. And there's a wonderful romp, you know, all the river runs with wine and the girls all go off with Aslan and have this fantastic Dionysian celebration. And there's a great bit where they all kind of collapse in a happy heap at the end of it. And and Lucy says, oh, that's wonderful. But she says, I wouldn't have felt quite safe with Bacchus and his fierce (laughs) menads if Aslan hadn't been there. And sensible Susan says, I should think not. But the the interesting thing to me was that when Walden Media made a film of that, you know, for the American market, they completely omitted that episode. It just didn't happen. It wouldn't. It wouldn't uh, hit on the the Protestant ses- sensibility, maybe. Or but actually, like it's a really important. It's a really important part. Sure is. Lewis's gospel. Lewis's gospel is thoroughgoingly Christocentric. It all turns on the death and resurrection of Jesus. But the point of the one is that it all turns on the death and resurrection of Jesus. So everything has to be brought to that, and many treasures will be brought to light as they are. It, that's the key. It almost. It almost has to be that way. Because if it's not that way, then it's it's exclusive and it and it hasn't accounted for the whole world, right? I mean, that's the that's the well, thing. you know, the thing that everybody likes to tr- quote, which is John three sixteen, you know, is God so loved the world, yeah. not God so loved a small group of pious people. I mean, I mean, of course, in Greek, the love word there is agape. It's not eros, and the the word for the world in Greek is ton cosmon. You know, God so agape the cosmos. That he sent his only son. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so that's really important. Uh, that one, 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 one has that sense of the vast, loving inclusion. That for me, 
is at the heart of the gospel that I believe. Absolutely. So I believe in a specific way. I'm a Christian and, you know, that's what I am. Yeah. But my Christianity is, um, as I used to say in, in the days when I was, a, well, I'm still a deadhead in some respects, but it is cosmic. <laughs> <laughs> well, before, before I let you go, I, you touched on the fact that I want to talk a little bit more about the fact that you're working on King Arthur yourself. Um, I have very little i feel like i'm catching up from what I, I never got into it as a as a kid and now i'm i am quite into it i have the what i know best is mallory um yeah. and even though that's from, from like the caxton the old caxton so the middle english which is yeah. really fun to read once you get the spirit of it yeah but, exactly. uh, but that's of course just one source you know and uh it's so it's such a big world the world of 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 king arthur and his knights and um before we, you know, before I like get into an analysis of stories or something, I thought I'd just take a moment to just kind of d delight in them in the way. I mean, if you could just tell us a bit about like what some of your favorite stories uh, or maybe your relationship with them throughout your life, what they are and, and how they've kind of moved yeah. you through the years. Well, I <laughs> do this at the end. How long have you got? So, yeah. <laughs> as I, long first as you want. Heard, I, I, they go right back to my earliest childhood. And not, I mean, to my, they literally go back to my pre-literate days, just as the stories go back to almost a pre-literate time. In most of these stories were told by bards and <laughs> most of the hearers, including the courtly and kingly hearers of these stories, didn't read or write. That was a thing that lettered men and monks did. Yep. So there was an oral tradition. And I, in a sense, like a child born out of time, actually experienced that because my mother, my Scottish mother, was a a commensurate storyteller and a great well of poetry and story. But she was also a historian and a scholar and she knew Mallory back to front. So she was working with original sources. She didn't, you know, foist on me these weird, these weird expurgated, cleaned up versions right, of it. Right. The more so, you talk about your mother, so just the more you talk about your mother, it seems like she's an extraordinary first contact person to have in this world. Oh, geez, yeah. <laughs> you know, she, I mean, I, we wouldn't be talking, well, obviously we wouldn't be talking today without my mother because my mother brought me into the world. But the insofar as I'm a poet, yeah, I'm a poet because of my mother and my grandmother. Mm -hmm. My grandmother was a poet who wrote a cycle of poems specifically about uh, St. Columba and St. Mungo and uh, Kentigern as he was, and full of the, the pagan stories. Being, you know, she was a published poet in Glasgow. She imbued my mother with a complete love of poetry. My mother gave that to me. So my mother used to tell me stories about King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table, just sitting down and speaking to me. And I loved them and I played it. And I always liked Galahad, you know, because I recognized that Lancelot was the kind of super fit captain and sporty you know, do you know what I mean I knew I was never going to be that kid you know yep. but something about Galahad and his visions and you know that I was so I was kind of was attracted to Galahad so those were important things to me but she told me the stories they were also the first mediation to me from an adult I mean an adult from whom I had complete love and security but they were nevertheless within the context of that love and security they were the first mediations to me of tragedy catastrophe mm. mortality i'll never forget i mean i couldn't have been more than six or seven my mother told me the story of the dolorous blow mm. so that's the, the story which creates the wasteland which create the, yes. the wound, which of course as you know it's balan and uh, balan but it's about, it's about it's about a knight who who um who goes finds himself mysteriously in the castle of the grail but he doesn't know it's the castle of the grail love because, the story uh, because you know uh, that's a mystery but he he gets into a quarrel with somebody who's been an invisible knight and he starts he, he slays somebody and then the king um at this breach of hospitality pursues him and his sword breaks and he has no weapon and he starts going through the castle and of course he comes to this you get this tremendous sense and my mother described this to me so well that he hears this faint chime and he comes into a holy room and it's like don't go in here but he's on the run he's feeling so he goes in here and then he sees this mystical procession he sees the vessel he sees the the, the grill he sees this spear you know kind of shimmering and from which drops of blood are coming and meantime his assailant is coming in who's in fact his host the king and 
you know, he breaks every taboo and he seizes the spear mm-hmm. and he turns around and stabs the, the king who's pursuing him in the thigh. And then there's complete calamity and darkness and the castle itself falls down. It was like the fall of a barren door. And, and, you know, when he eventually kind of picks himself up out of the ruin, it, he comes to know that what he's done is taken the spear of Longinus, that this is the spear that wounded Christ. This is the most sacred thing. And he's used it actually to slay his host in the kind of utter desecration of hospitality. And not only has he brought ruin on himself and on the, but, but he has to, Merlin comes and finds him and he goes out, you know, and he recovers his own sword. And he, he rides out through a completely wasted land. This is where Elliot gets the wasteland and everything like that. Yep. And wherever he goes, my mom, my mother telling me people curse him because he's done this terrible thing. But, you know, my little boy, I was saying, but he didn't know, he didn't know. But another bit of me is going like, he should have known. Yep. But the idea that you could do yep. something yourself that brought utter calamity on everybody else, that was a new idea to me. And then, of course, it gets worse because he goes and fights an unknown knight who is his twin brother, and he doesn't know it. Yeah. And the two get to the point where they slay each other. and they then slay they each other. But, you know, my mother would let her, I was like, oh, my God. But then, of course, my mother tells me, but the sword... Merlin took from these two dead brothers who'd slain each other and he set it in a red marble stone and he caused it to float on a thing because he knew that the healing would come and the grail knight would come and then of course Galahad comes to the court you know and he will be the one who will eventually take that same spear and go back to that castle which has been partly rebuilt and ride through the wasteland and with the drops of blood from the spear will heal the wounded king the yeah. king, the healing of the king so what my mother didn't tell me, which is a thing I'm exploring, now, that Galahad himself, I mean, Galahad is begotten, if you like, illicitly, when, when Lancelot strays to the same castle and the king's daughter, Pepele, is the king's daughter, Elaine, is enchanted so that he, Lancelot thinks he, she's Guinevere. And the moment when Lancelot finally commits the sin of adultery, as he thinks, that he thinks he's sleeping, he's not sleeping with Guinevere, you know, he's real, but what he does, that's when Galahad is begotten. Now, Tennyson doesn't give us any of that. Oh, yeah, that's all just completely cleaned up. Wow. But actually, for me, that idea that just in the point of misery and with the very instruments of the misery or just at a point of straying, an amazing grace can be loosed in the world. Yep. The whole thing can, you know, that's you catastrophe. As to, now, I, I just find that so resonant as a story and so necessary to tell again. That's great. Yeah. I mean, I remember just recently going through a couple of years ago when I was trying to get through this, again, middle English from Caxton, you can get there, but it, if you're untrained, it takes a little bit of time. And it's one of those things where, you know, th- the same word can be spelled three different ways on the same page. And it's, I know, just, it's great. It's, it's, it's so great. Different. It's so oh. great. Once you get into the rhythm of it. But then the, I remember the point of getting to that where he gets the spear and uses it. And then it says that it was the spear that was that was used to pierce the side of Christ. And I just stopped. I was like, did I read that right? And I was looking back. And, <laughs> did I get that? Is it a, and I thought, man, that is a story and a half. Like anyone who's but willing to. Think that's a classic story. Yeah. That's what they did was these, these, this cycle of stories is woven into the cycle of the Christian stories. So why is that spear even there? Right. Why is the Well, we've got well, this fantastic backstory about right. Joseph of Arimathea. Right. Who is the real character in John's gospel? Who's the guy who gives up his own grave so that Jesus can lie in it? And it's like, well, he kind of fades out of the gospel story. And you're like, what happened to him? Well, the answer, according to, to the Arthurian legends, is that he was imprisoned at the, by the Sanhedrin after the persecution of Christians. He was meant to be starved to death in a tower. Jesus appeared to him and gave him the chalice. And he was fed from that, that. And then when the full persecution comes after the siege of Jerusalem, Joseph was a, was, a, was a trader. He was a Phoenician trader. And we do know that, in fact, the Phoenicians traded um, with Cornwall, with the tin, the tin mines in Cornwall. So the story was that he sailed with the chalice and the spear and the other relics and came to Britain. Yeah. And then he founds a church there. And that he walks to Glastonbury and that when he plants his staff in the earth there the sign that that's where he should be the staff flowers into a flowering thorn which is still there you know that's it's still there and it's still and the tradition of the glastonbury thorn is that it when i say it's still there it was 
it flowers on Christmas Eve, it flowers at the time of the incarnation. But anyway, interestingly, this goes so deeply into the British psyche that when we had our Puritan revolution and we were trying to get rid of all these, and the Puritans hated these stories and hated everything about it and hated the idea of sacred kingship. Mm. I'll tell you the extraordinary thing. On the day of the Reg, on the day they beheaded Charles I, at the same time, they had somebody go out to Glastonbury and hack down the thorn. Wow. You know, That's they understood that. No they, they, they repudiated it. Wow. But they're saying we're getting rid of kings and we're getting rid of this stuff as well. But of course, what happened was that everybody in Glastonbury came and took cuttings of it yep. and planted it everywhere. And there are still there are still thorns. I literally, 10 years ago, I was invited to a ceremony in a Cambridge college of the balming of the thorn because this college very proudly had a sign of the Glastonbury thorn that had been brought by royalists from that and planted in this college garden. Really? They literally tied ribbons on it and danced around it. They wanted me to come and sing my song, The Green Man, there, you know? <laughs> like, this stuff is not dead, you know? <laughs> oh my God. And, and so there's, an early, there's an earlier legend that, in fact, not only did he bring the chalice, but that earlier, because one story is, version of the story is that, is that Joseph of Arimathea is sort of Jesus' uncle. Because there's a big blank in the story of Jesus from when he's 12 in the temple to when he appears, you know, John, the idea is that he took the infant Jesus to England on one of these journeys. So right. William Blake's famous thing, which is effectively our national anthem, you know, apart from God's over the queen, and did those feet in ancient time walk upon England's mountains green and was the holy lamb of God on England's pleasant pastures seen and did the countenance divine shine forth upon our clouded hills and was Jerusalem builded here among those dark satanic mills. We sing that. Yeah. Everybody knows that in England. And it's the Glastonbury legend. It's just, <laughs> so it's kind of quite deeply rooted in who we are. And I think all for the good. Yeah. There's a say every so often we get these these anti-legendary kind of Puritan reactions and they try and hack it down, but nobody can hack it down. It just grows. And and this is this has got to be kind of what's in the mind all the time of somebody like Tolkien when he's trying to and eventually does get across to C.S. Lewis that like all of these things that you love are pointing back to this one event. And if you wanna, if you wanna synthesize your mind again you know like he says in that poem that you talk about yeah, what is the, the yeah, two yeah. the two female gods or whatever yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah this you this is this is the way you do it basically yeah, is, exactly yeah that's incredible so when okay so looking at all this like centuries of fascination with this <clears> king, arthur, <throat> king arthur stories and all their iterations so there's an immortal aspect to them, obviously, but the story does change over the centuries or a different, there's different, exactly. em different emphasis the and stuff. One about the Arthurian legend is there's no authorized version. There's yeah. no single source. Yeah. The sources yeah. are multiple, they're in many languages. Yeah. And yeah. what that creates is freedom. Yeah. Is it allows each storyteller to retell the story. There's nobody who can tell you you told it wrong. Right. You know, because in some cases it's Percival who achieves the grail in others. Galahad is a later invention. He comes in, but he's the one I want to stay with. Yeah. You know, in the earliest Arthur stories, the best knight is Gawain, not Lancelot. Gawain is the right. early Welsh knight. Yeah, you know, there's all these different variations of it. And I think the story has to be retold almost with each generation, but certainly every hundred years or so. We need to reassimilate our own legend. So you're you're right. making a contribution now. And, I'm trying to do that. That's exactly and, and what. I'm what what? How do you isolate what's most important or, or you know relevant today? Like how do you do that? Well, it's a really interesting and difficult question. And I thought about. <laughs> I mean, I'm only starting. I only started this thing really in this last year. But I've been thinking about it for thirty years. You know. Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, this is the thing. I. I mean, that's partly why I, you know, re retired early from my job in Cambridge. Region and this little place in Norfolk is. I'm trying to give this decade of my life to doing this thing, fully conscious of everybody who's done it before, from from Geoffrey of Monmouth to Mallory to you know to Tennyson to to in his own ways C.S. Lewis to Charles Williams, David Jones, you know, T.H. White, obviously. Um, so you knew you wanted to do this, and you've this is a big part of the reason why you retired early. You're saying, yeah, 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 okay. yeah. I, I'm trying wow. to do this. Various things are stopping me from doing it all the time now. Yeah. Of course. You know, um, 
And um, I eventually want to tell the entire cycle, but I'm working on the grail stuff first, because it's my, even though it comes later in the story, I'm beginning, as they say, in medias res in the midst of things. And what I'm working on now is a grail cycle in three books, three poetic books, each of which consists of a series of ballads. I'm using the ballad form that, that um, Coleridge used so well in the Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, varying the verses in various ways. So I'm, I'm, I've written two of those three now, mm. and I'm on the third, which is the most difficult one, which is the one about the actual achievement of the Grail. You know, yeah. And I, I'm, you know, I'm daunted by it, but I'm constantly returning to the sources. And one of the things I need to do is go to all the places and absorb it. Yeah. Um, so it's a big project, uh, and it may go. I mean, you know, there may be no market for it, but I, it's not. I don't actually. For me, it's almost a mystical thing. It's actually. I want to utter this in language now, at this moment, in our, at this cultural moment. And how I do, I mean, obviously one of the things that I'm very conscious of, which previous generations weren't conscious of, is, is, is the, the way we've trashed the earth in the last two or 300 years yep. and the, the severing of the relationship with land and water. And of course, suddenly all this stuff makes loads of sense. You know, these ladies of the lake, these, these, these green knights, these people who are earth and water, yeah. speaking to us in human form. So that's a thing that's really important to me. Yeah. The Grail is important. And the Grail understood not only as the sacred vessel, and I mean, for me, the Grail is very much what it is. It's the chalice that Jesus held, but it's also the earth herself. It's also how creation receives the, you know, it's 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 a it's an isthmus and meeting point of the heaven and earth. You know, it's it is Christ himself in a way. Um, so, you know, there's all kinds of stuff going on in there. Um, there are issues for me, and one of the ways I'm retelling it, I mean, in the, in the, in the um, this is the thing I'm wrestling with right now, in the Mallory narrative, you know, the three grail knights who finally it pairs down to them and everybody else has misadventures, which are Sir Bors, Sir Percival and Sir Galahad who are finally going to make it there with, with Lancelot as a sort of wannabe add-on who can't quite, make it because of the Guinevere thing but they in the Mallory they all end up on this magic ship which a beautiful maiden um knows all about and it was a ship that was built by Solomon and all this you know biblical stuff and it's got a spindle in it that Eve herself put there and so you know all this stuff is going on but there's no backstory in Mallory for who this maiden is except that we discover that she's Sir Percival's sister the earlier French stories give her a name Dendrin, and they have a little bit about her but but I thought I can't tell this story without seriously telling it from her perspective. She, in my mind, is just as much a Grail Knight as the, the three men. In yeah. fact, they wouldn't they wouldn't achieve the quest without her, and she always knows more than they do. And mm -hmm. in Mallory, she ends up, you know, giving her own life and giving her own life's blood for another person, and so on. And she doesn't she doesn't achieve the Grail in this life, but she's there at the end on this sacred ship. There's almost like a, the Grey Havens as we go. So I'm now writing a ballad of the quest of Fair Dan Drain, which has, for which I have no source material. Right, that's quite interesting. Well, they don't go. tell it. Yeah. So I'm trying to imagine her and I'm thinking about her and we know that her mother's sister, her aunt was a hermitess and she also meets Persever. So I am telling a whole story about mm. a nurturing of this girl by her wise aunt and the two of them living in the forest together and her, how she comes to know about Solomon's ship and how she becomes a grail maiden. And, you know, I'm, I'm having to tell that story because nobody else has told it. That's fascinating. And I'm telling it partly because I'm a man of my own generation. And I understand that in a lot of these stories, though the maidens are important, their voices are not given, their voice has been suppressed. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to tell it from her story and I'm conscious of my readers. I want, I mean, I think I, this might be read by the end. It might be read by the kind of people that read, read Harry Potter or whatever, you know, maybe. So <clears throat> I want all the girls who read my story to be as thrilled and longing into the heroic as the boys. Now, George MacDonald does that brilliant. George MacDonald's stories are full of wise women. Yeah, so, I I, I just read the Golden uh, Ball. Was it the Golden Ball yeah, where these the parallel key. story? Uh, golden key, key, sorry, Golden Key, where the parallel these parallel stories, the boy and the girl go off and have their adventures. And you're right, he does do that. Um, and yeah, how how do you how do you how do you blaze that trail? Like you say, uh, 
you know, be the well, luckily because there's no there's no authorized version. There are so many variations. I can just add my variation to it. Right, and people can take it as it comes. And, and if and, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's wonderful. That's so cool. Um, well, I guess I don't know, I think we're at like an hour forty, so I should probably yeah. wind it down. But um, I wanted to say uh, just before we, we go, uh, we talked about the imagination uh, in in a kind of deeper sense. Um, what people are listening, maybe or, or watching, wondering about you know practices or or just patterns of mind that you find stimulating um for the imagination what would they be i mean is it just for you is it just a matter of reading that's what reading is really important and it's reading can i just say i think if you want to stimulate your imagination don't read books about books don't read criticism of poetry right. i mean i say that having written books about books myself but um read the primary sources yep. plato is much re easier to read the original dialogues of plato are much easier to read than any book about plato the author's stories are way easier to read than any of the learned books about them. Don't put so much distance between you and the, yeah. Read the primary shaping text yeah. and let yeah. them shape you. Don't read secondary literature, read primary literature. Hmm. And in a sense, that's what I'm doing. I mean, I have just published this book about, you know, the imagination. I think it's important to do, I've done it. But really, this decade for me is about stopping writing academic literary criticism and writing primary poetry. That's what I'm going to do this decade. Well, it's a it's a pleasure to 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 watch you do it, and it's a pleasure to hear you talk about it. And uh, I want to thank you for agreeing to come on again and and uh, have a nice long conversation about this stuff. I love talking about this stuff, and I know people will love hearing about it. Um, so. Thank you very, very much, Malcolm, and, and I wish okay. you the best of luck in your in your okay, creative yeah, endeavors. Right. And good, good luck to your imagination. <laughs> That's right. Until next time. <laughs>